And uh, we move on to uh, Mark Anderson, who will give us and provide us with clinical data on a novel right ventricular support with the Impella RP. I know that Mark is uh, working with us uh, right ventricular pump for quite some time, and we've also now our first experience with it are very positive, so looking forward to hear your presentation, Mark. Thank you, Herman. Uh, it's, it's certainly a pleasure and an honor for me to be here. I hope everyone is uh, as excited and inspired as I am about what's being done and, and what we're going to be able to do and, and going to do in the future. I was asked to present a little bit of the clinical data with the Impella RP and hopefully um, if we have enough time to discuss some of the clinical issues with the uh, RP at the end of the discussion. I'd like to thank uh, Awana for the, the help with the data here um, and, and putting the data together. Um, I'd like to refer to the RV as the new LV as uh, a lot of people are, are focusing their attention and investigation on the RV or including the RV in their investigation because we don't know a lot of things about the RV. What we do know is that the incidence of RV failure is very real. It can be quite significant, up to 30% of cases, depending on the clinical entity. And we also know that no matter what the clinical entity is, the morbidity and mortality associated with uh, RV failure is quite high, and it increases um, in the presence of right ventricular failure. What we're learning is that the right ventricle is certainly different than the left ventricle. Its vascularity, muscularity, its response to preload, afterload is different than the left ventricle. And while the, the pathophysiology of right ventricular failure is similar to LV failure, it is different in many regards. But we're also learning, and what's coming out of this, is that biventricular and the interdependence and biventricular dysfunction is certainly more common than perhaps we thought or that we were really willing to admit. Uh, if you look at the algorithms for the treatment of right ventricular dysfunction, historically, our VADs were at the very, very bitter end. And um, that was really because all we had was surgical VADs and the morbidity and mortality associated with them was high. Yet we have data that suggest if we intervene earlier, the outcomes are better. And that's certainly true on the left side or the right side. But the bottom line was we needed new technology. And so the Impella RP um, is a, uh, a redesign, I, I guess you could say, to a certain extent, of the left-sided devices. Um, but, the, uh, uh, but some differences being that um, certainly it's not pulling blood from the left ventricle to the aorta, but pushing blood from the right atrium to the PA, and is also not direct uh, ventricular unloading like we see on the left side. So there's, there's certainly some differences there. Um, it is a percutaneous device um, uh, designed for insertion into the common femoral vein capable of, of quite robust unloading and flow. And there has been a, a, a redesign or a second generation of the pump that's um, been based on a lot of very sophisticated imaging to hopefully make it more um, implantable and then uh, stable. And this is uh, taken from, from Dan's uh, work and his application, just to show you the impact. Uh, and there are some differences, obviously, in the pressure volume loop of the right ventricle here with an, an impaired right ventricle and a normal left ventricle on the left side. But just to show you the, the certainly the unloading power of the, of the RP. And then the, the, the um, changes on the left side with respect to the uh, improvement in cardiac output and, and uh, return to the left side. And that's a patient of ours, uh, the x-rays of just, again, to reinforce the unloading. Uh, and you can see the decompression of the right side from the pre and post implant of the RP. So in terms of the clinical studies, I was, um, um, I'm, I'm honored to present on, on behalf of all the investigators and the co-principal investigator with me and Bill O'Neill. The studies we have now, as you know, the Impella has been approved uh, and hoping to get the PMA approval in the fall. Um, but we had the recover right and then the continued access and then the post-approval study with really 60 patients being enrolled. But the difference in terms of these studies, the post-approval study, um, as with most of them, the inclusion criteria was, were a bit more relaxed. And as opposed to meeting really exact uh, inclusion criteria, we just were going on the presence of right ventricular dysfunction. 
And this was the, the kind of uh, trial or the, the model. Uh, we had two arms. One was, was post-LVAD uh, and the other was really post-AMA shock and post-cardiotomy. And you can see here that the bulk of these patients were, in fact, post-surgical patients with 50 out of 60 of them were post-surgical, some being regular heart surgery and transplant. And you can see that there was a, a significant number of patients enrolled but, uh, or were screened, and we only were able to enroll 60. And you see the screening failures there that was really that the presence of RV just, uh, failure was not present was the number one cause. And you can see the definition of right ventricular failure that we were using. So the patient characteristics, not surprisingly, were quite similar. And for the patients in the LVAD arm, uh, not, again, not surprising with a lower ejection fraction, higher percentage of patients having uh, congestive heart failure, but really quite similar overall. In terms of the procedural characteristics, I think this is, is, is important with respect to, um, you know, the device was successfully placed in a very high number of these patients. Uh, they were implanted from the right side. Sick group of patients in terms of, of being on pressors and ionotropes and looking at the index and the pulmonary artery pulsatility index. And uh, the duration of support being around four days. Um, across the board in between three and four days, and then the pump flows being around three liters, and you see 6.8 liters, or, or the P level was at 6.8, which is reflective of there was some tinkering uh, with the device, especially in the LVAD uh, patient population to try to match right and left sided flows. In looking at the hemodynamics, you can see the uh, uh, the, the unloading effect as well as the improvement uh, in the left-sided output, both between the recover right and then for the, all the clinical studies. And then uh, a secondary endpoint we were looking at with respect to the ability to reduce support in the patients that were uh, supported with the R RP device. Uh, in terms of outcomes, um, you know, if you look at the benchmark of, of the other data that's available with respect to the other approved uh, RVAD, certainly slightly better, um, and slightly better in the LVAD arm than in the, the uh, cohort B. And this is uh, for the recover right data, the uh, six month survival, 180 day survival. In terms of predictors of, of hospital death, uh, there were no multivariate predictors, but looking at univariate predictors, not surprising really, and some, some lends some credibility, again, to the pulmonary artery pulsatility index and, and certainly shows how sick some of these patients were. And looking at some of the secondary endpoints, uh, obviously, again, we mentioned that 50 out of 60 of these patients were post-surgical, so there was some, some bleeding. But device bleeding or device-related bleeding was really quite low. Hemolysis, again, um, these were LVAD patients. Hard to tell if it was from the LVAD or the, or the RVAD and then post-surgical patients. But you know, clinically relevant hemolysis in terms of needing a device to be removed was quite low. And then some of the other things like pulmonary embolism, valve dysfunction, very uncommon. In terms of the IQ database now, you can see there's 50,000 left-sided pumps been implanted and then 750 on the right side. So we're, we're still very early in this and have a lot to learn. But these are the indications. And the majority of cases, as opposed to what we saw in the trial now, is AMI shock. And again, what I was mentioning earlier about the biventricular indication here, you're seeing about 30% of these patients being biventricular patients. So it's going to be interesting to see as that data starts to unfold. And again, the duration of support, again, about the same as what we were seeing in the trial three, four days. So the clinical issues that we've seen, and there's a, a recent paper in the European uh, Journal of Heart Failure that again suggests that we are unable to accurately predict RV failure. I mean, we do have identifiers, we have the CVP wedge ratio and POPI, but we have not been able to predict RV failure with any degree of uh, efficiency. Uh, we did see that some of the um, implant uh, was more successful, not in the operating room. As a heart surgeon, I'm, I'm uh, a little bit embarrassed by this, but I do think that uh, the collaborative approach has improved outcomes in, in terms of implantabil implantability between surgeons and uh, interventional cardiologists working together. Going from the right femoral vein to the left pulmonary artery seems to be the favorable position. 
There have been some uh, anticoagulation issues uh, that have been uncovered, and I think it still brings back up the issue of anticoagulation, how to evaluate it, um, and reinforces the control of surgical bleeding. But I think this is a clinical issue that we still need to work on, as well as uh, the weaning. Is weaning the right side different than weaning the left side? But I think. Um, uh, we're going to get that information. And then lastly, the outcomes seem to be optimized when a, a heart team, a heart recovery team, is involved with this. So in conclusion, um, you s we can see, uh, again, that the, the predictability of RV failure is difficult. Uh, the RP device has worked well um, in terms of improving hemodynamics, um, powerful unloading. Um, the safety profile of the device is really quite good. We've been able to impact survival uh, favorably, and it, it does seem that the RP is going to evolve as a, a really viable strategy for recovery, both univentricular and biventricular support, or as definitive therapy. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, Just a quick question. On a practical basis, when you have an individual with bad LV dysfunction and a, and a poor pappy, do you prophylactically do it? Are you empirical? Do you see, when you see a volume load, the left ventricle does not actually, you can't volume load the ventricle, that's when you put it in. What's the sequence that you use in your institution? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, um, I, we wanted to present some clinical stuff with this, but that's a very good question. And usually our habit is, is to implant the left side. And usually, kind of historically, we would walk away at that point. And um, so as was mentioned earlier, I think the, uh, the placement of a right heart catheter to then stay and watch and see what the hemodynamics do, because commonly they will transiently improve. You'll see CBP go down, the numbers are getting cardiac index has gone up or cardiac power output's gone up, and then 30 minutes later, everything starts to trend in the wrong direction. And we add, uh, go ahead and then add right ventricular support. So I think depending on the clinical indication, sometimes we'll do it right up front, but more often that we will give a chance to optimize them and, and see what the right side's gonna do. Point of view. I mean, you would do, usually do an elevated implantation, obviously, in the regular cardiac OR, and now you need, uh, you think that you need the additional arm. Where do you do it? Do you do, so, use a C arm? What uh, do you do? Yeah, it's a good question, Herman. Um, we started to, to do it in the operating room with a C arm, but what I, what really increased our I think likelihood of success and comfort was to call the interventional cardiologist to the operating room. And so moving the patient down to the cath lab or the hybrid room, which is somewhat cumbersome and, and at times you're, you're in trouble, you can't do. The data suggests that the outcomes are better in the cath lab and better in the hybrid room. Now, whether that's because the interventional cardiologists are doing it there, um, but I do think it's, it goes back to a collaborative approach to work on these, because the, the implant technique on the right side is a little different than the left. Might actually need a modicum of skill to put some of these in sometimes. <laughs> Mark, I had, a quick, I had two questions for you. So one is, um, you know, based on your experience and your knowledge in the field and uh, expertise, can you tell us who you would not put an RP in and you might opt for a Centromag RVED just from, a, from your surgical perspective? And then the second question is, uh, do you think that um, if there were, you know, especially with the ProTech duo in existence, uh, do you think that if there were an IJRP available do you think that would alter the, uh, the rate of implantation? And uh, especially since we're talking a lot about 5.0 and ambulation, uh, some people are choosing Protect Duo because it allows people to ambulate. So those two would really help with the insight. <clears throat> I, I, it's, it's who we would not put an RP in. I think the obviously kind of contraindications, the patient with uh, mechanical valve on the right side, very uncommon, or thrombus that's going to be uh, an interference either in the pelvis or the IVC or some other issue there. Uh, unfortunately, I was going to show a case um, with a pulmonary, uh, I'm sorry, an IVC filter in place, and that's, that's a relative contraindication. But in terms of kind of degree of right ventricular dysfunction, um, which are the cases that we want to go more to a surgical VAD, I've been very impressed with the, the capability and the, 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 you know, hemo, the ability for hemodynamic support on uh, unloading with the RP. So unless I'm faced with a, a real kind of anatomic issue or, 
um, you know, something along those lines, we generally would start with an RP and, and then escalate as necessary. The, the ambulation issue is very real, though, and some of those patients with um, pre-existing significant RV dysfunction or a, a very, um, you know, significant RV injury that's not going to recover, because we're, we're talking about recovery and we, RV or recovery in general can take days or weeks or months. So we may be compelled to, to alter our strategy in that setting, but in general, we would go with the percutaneous, with the RP device initially, uh, and then, you know, heart team reevaluate and decide what we need to do. I would like to, uh, to know your opinion of, uh, with respect to primary pulmonary diseases. So patients with very high pulmonary uh, pressure due to vascular diseases are probably to use this device as a time-winning goal until tr the real drugs are working. Absolutely. I think the indications, it showed you the common indications, but there are emerging indications, you know, support after therapy for a pulmonary embolism, prophylactic use. Uh, I used it to uh, support the right side and decompress for a pericardiectomy uh, this week that worked really well. We have used it in pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary hypertensive crisis to do just as you said, to get them, you know, a patient comes in decompensated, to get them on medical therapy, to get them through that crisis, so to speak. Obviously, they're not recovering their pulmonary, you know, disease, but can get them on to a next therapy, and the pump is certainly robust enough to deal with that kind of afterload. We actually had a, a, a septal hematoma that was compressing the outflow track of the RV and actually let it resorb using this as basically an internal bypass. There's a lot of diverse applications. As the, uh, as the inflow is in the left, uh, in the right atrium and the outflow is the pulmonary artery, physiology is certainly very different for the for right ventricle than it is for the left ventricle. And you are showing in a slide that you are talking about unloading the right ventricle. You could also argue that increasing the offload of the right ventricle could be a load for the right ventricle. Do you have any data about physiology of the ventricle itself during this support? Yeah, no, um, that's a very good point. It is different. It is not direct. Uh, right ventricular unloading, and, and in fact, the RV can see an increase in afterload or with a, a relative elevation of pulmonary vascular resistance. So that's a, a good point, and I think that's data that we need to, to obtain and, and take a closer look at.